One year ago, my husband Jeremy and I, along with our six kids, abandoned every shred of comfort and inertia to go on the adventure of a lifetime. We said goodbye to the suburban dream to start a farm deep in the heart of Judea. This is the story of our journey, what we've learned along the way, and how our lives have been transformed. This is our Judean experiment. Here's an entry from Jeremy's journal way back from the days right before our leap. I can't sleep. My heart is beating way too fast for a guy lying motionless in bed. My house on the farm isn't ready yet. I can't believe I really sold my home. This was the only way I could pull it off. What if I jump in and the waters actually split? What happens if they don't? I'm exhausted. We've been traveling with all our kids for more than a month, homeless, just buying time until our house is done. Ashkelon, Tiberia, Jerusalem, Efrat, I'm so tired of packing and unpacking. I wonder if all of our stuff is stolen. For the last nine days, I hired a Bedouin to guard my house and our things because we still don't have a door. I had to vacate all our possessions from Neve Daniel. God bless those sweet buyers for letting us keep our boxes and furniture in their house for so long. Hashem, I'm walking after you into the unknown, into the desert. Please guide us, protect my children in Tehillah, give her strength. This is the scariest thing I've ever done. I'm so tired and I can't sleep. Hashem, give me koach. I just need to fight through this time. Soon we'll be on the mountain. Nothing will ever be the same again. A new day, a new life for the rest of my life. Jeremy Gimpel. Hello, Tehila Gimpel. Thank you for sharing that from your journal. You know, it's so funny the way that our minds work are so different, how your journals are literally just an entry from every day. And I look back to my notebooks at that time, and it's just the mind of a madman. It's like I, sometimes I'm writing uh, uh, memories, sometimes I'm writing prayers. It's just one big balagan. Eventually, one day, someone's going to go through these journals and actually just institutionalize me. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the mind of a madman. But it's cool to look back and to read the struggles that I was just trying to cl clarify the thoughts racing through my mind just to put them down on paper. And just recently, I found that the Eish Kodesh, his first advice, the Piasetsna Rebbe, the rabbi of the Warsaw Ghetto, is that everyone needs to crystallize their thoughts by writing them all down on paper. And so it's cool that I was intuitively doing that. I feel like I can't otherwise. But here I am now, and it's just amazing looking back on that over a year ago now. So now when you look back on that and you compare it to where you are today, where we are today, what does that look like to you? What does that make you feel? You know, it's so funny because I'm like reading here how tired I was. This was before we were even sued by the three left-wing organizations funded by Europe to destroy all of our farm. Oh, so those were the good times. These were like, writing, exactly. You were writing in the chilled out I, times. Yeah, I'm already just like kind of nervous about the whole thing. All of our money sort of at risk. I didn't realize that that was just the beginning of the hard times. Like traveling around for a month with our kids. Okay, we've like, you know, we've traveled on an RV across the United States. We've like gone on adventures before. So, okay, this uh, was just the beginning of the hard times, really. I mean, when we first moved into our house, because we had that challenge of not being able to move in because we had sold our house, had to vacate our house, but our house wasn't finished. Even when we moved into our house, when a builder finishes a house, usually a professional cleaning team comes and cleans the house, polishes it, makes it sparkling clean for you to walk into. Our house was covered in dust, filled with things, and the dust of the desert had blown into our house because we didn't have windows and we didn't have a door. It was just insane. Do you remember the first night when we went to sleep on our... <laughs> I won't call it beds because it wasn't a bed, that mat on the floor. Do you remember? <laughs> do you remember what happened when we lay down in bed? What happened? <laughs> we bounced onto our beds in exhaustion and this huge plume of dust came <laughs> flying out of them. And normal people would be like, well, we should change our sheets, shouldn't we? We were just like, looked at each other like, we're too tired. Good yeah. night. Yeah. <laughs> we the, just slept yeah. in the dust pile. In the dust. Yeah. So looking back at that, it's like, you know, Bar Hashem, our house is like well and we have beds and we, our house is relatively clean before Shabbat. And here we are. You know, it's like miraculous how far we've come. We're lucky that we're on radio and not TV so that you could tell people our house looks normal before Shabbat and they don't have to actually know the truth. <laughs> our 
else looks great. You're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you, dear. Um, so this week was a really big day for the Jewish people. Yeah, it seems like the Jewish people are going through some type of berur, some kind of clarification, some sort of purification. Which direction is this country headed in the nation of Israel hasn't really decided. We are uh, split down the middle. Mm. So our election day was a really special day for our family. We tried to think what was the best day in, you know, in, in, in Israel, the uh, election day is a vacation day. So we decided to do something special with the kids. We wanted to make it into a real experience for them. So the first thing we did was to go to Marat HaMachpelah, to the tomb of the patriarchs, and pray with the kids for a good outcome in the elections for, for the Jewish people. And then we went to Kiryat Gat. There was a program called Zazim Yamina, Moving to the Right, where um, people from different settlements in Judea and Samaria uh, were sent to different cities around Israel where voter turnout is usually low and just sent to go from house to house, encouraging people to vote and helping them to go vote if they need help, giving them a ride. So we went with our six kids down to Kiryat Gat and the kids were so cute, just running from door to door. Anyway, so when we were in Marada Machpela, uh, I was asking each of the kids, I said, you know, why don't you guys daven and, you know, pray your own special prayer to Hashem. Um, you know, just from your heart, talk to Hashem like he's your Abba, he's your father. So all the kids were praying. And then Noam, I was kind of helping him along. And Noam is our, is our four-year-old boy. And he says, he closed his eyes, he says, I, I just want to say thank you to Hashem. I said, wow, that's really beautiful. He goes, and I, I want to ask Hashem to send Mashiach. I said, oh, amen, that's so beautiful, Noam. And then he saw a feather fly by, and he says, and I want to ask Hashem for more feathers, <laughs> a lot of feathers. And I'm like, okay, whatever floats your boat, buddy. And so then we finished, we finished, uh, praying at Marat HaMachpelah, and we went, uh, we went to Kiryat Gat to go from door to door. And we're in, we went to one of the poorest neighborhoods in Kiryat Gat, trying to find you know, people that needed help to get to the elections. And as we're going from one building to the next, suddenly Noam sees this huge pile of feathers. <laughs> really, I have no idea why there was a huge pile of feathers. And I said to him, Noam, look, Hashem answered your prayer. There's a huge pile of feathers. And he was just so thrilled. And I thought to myself, I really patted myself on the back and I said, oh, that was a great parenting moment, a great teachable moment. I really taught him about the power of prayer. And I really, I did a great job there. And then suddenly I realized I didn't do anything. I wasn't teaching him. This wasn't a teachable moment that I was turning into a great moment. Hashem was teaching him, hmm. right? Hashem communicates with each person. We kind of think of it as like Hashem, we have, a, of course, we have a relationship with Hashem, but our yeah, kids, we're like teaching them to have, even children have a relationship with Hashem. And on each person's level of where they're at and the things that matter to them, Hashem is training them. And I realized like Hashem in his, in his, you know, in, in, at Noam's level was training him to have faith, to believe in the power of his own prayers and how lucky I was to just be a witness to that amazing interaction between Hashem and Noam. You know, we've been talking a lot about prayer because I really feel like the heart of this farm, the Arugot farm, is prayer. I feel like the people that come here, they're not coming here only to learn Torah, but they're coming here to have some sort of prayerful moment. Even if it's not in a sidur or it's not in words, they come out here and they're having a prayerful moment. Mm -hmm. I don't know how else to explain it. You know, sometimes when people walk around our house, we have this beautiful deck that's uh, right off the Arugot Valley. And literally every person that walks there, you hear, they go, oh, 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 oh. each person has their own little like breath taken moment where their breath is literally taken away. And, you know, in Hebrew, breath is nishima and soul is nishama. And it's something about the place here that is just takes your breath away. It touches your soul. They're having like this moment where their soul is activated by coming out to these mountains. So a few days after we got moved to the farm, your brother actually brought um, a rabbi out from, from the United States. One of the top rabbis of the Orthodox Union in the United States. Mm -hmm. And we took him out to that spot right where you see the magnificent uh, Arugot Valley. And he says, wow, isn't there a bracha that you should say for this? Isn't there a blessing that you should say for this? And we kind of scratched our heads and looked at each other and we couldn't actually think of a specific blessing that you're supposed to say in such a situation. Is there, is there a bracha for unbelievable, majestic beauty? And later I kind of reflected back on that moment and I said that, that I felt like that urge 
to make a bracha, to just call out to Hashem, to praise, it's, it's, something that, it's something that's beyond the ability to put into a box or a category of law. Um, it's just going back to that original soul space that inspired people to write all of the original brachas. And that's, and that's the power, you know, that was the power of this place is to, is to awaken that inner yearning just to call out and praise Hashem. Well, that's what's just so crazy is that when I first came out to this farm almost four years ago, I was going through my own religious crisis at the time. And I remember I'm in Neve Daniel and there's a synagogue there called The Box because it is shaped like a box. It is like two caravans that are smushed together and people get there and that's sort of what we have right now for a shul until today in this beautiful community in Neve Daniel. And I remember just looking around and it just looked like everyone was saying watermelon over and over again. Just watermelon, 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 watermelon. And I'm like, are their ears hearing what their mouth is saying? Are they talking to God? Are they like what? It's just, it looked like uh, Catholic priests just mumbling Latin in words that they didn't understand. And I just, I just didn't, I just, it was driving me nuts. It was driving me nuts. And probably it was just, I'm just projecting my own issues onto these. These people are probably the holiest people in the world. I just couldn't do it anymore. That reminds me of something funny that you taught me once a few years ago, that the word for the Yiddish word, the Jewish word for prayer is davening. And davening actually comes in the Yid, in the original Yiddish from the word daffening, daff. Daff means a page. So there's, there's this kind of sense sometimes that, that I know you were having. We're just turning pages we're, here. We're, you were literally just felt like you were turning pages. You're like, I'm daffening. I'm daff, daff, turning page, page, but nothing, nothing internally was actually happening to you. Well, so just what I feel is that I want to live a guided life. How do I live a guided life? I want prayer is the key. Prayer is the beginning. Prayer is our relationship. Prayer is our words. It's Hashem's response. It's everything all in one. And I wanted to take my prayer seriously. I wanted it to be meaningful. I wanted it to be impactful. I wanted it to be sincere. And I was like, that's it. I'm out of the synagogue. And I just found these mountains here, which were just breathtaking. I'm like, that's it. That's my new synagogue. And I used to come here every day and go to the mountain, literally right outside my staff house. And I wanted to sing the morning prayers. So I picked up a guitar that I'd fiddled around with a little bit in high school. And I came out here and I wanted to sing Psuke de Zimra. And then from a place of song, you enter into the Shema and Shmon Esri, meaning the prophets gave us the technology, the, the map of how to achieve some sort of spiritual moment in prayer. And it says that the first part of the morning prayers is called Psuke de Zimra, passages of song. It's not called Psuke de Milmul, passages of mumbling. It's called passages of song. And the truth is, in Sephardic communities, they've actually maintained that tradition, and many of the things are sung in Shul. Only in the Ashkenazic world did we just maintain the structure, the names of the sections of the prayer, but we just mumble through it. And I was like, that's it. I want a guitar. I'm coming out to the mountains, and I want my prayer to be meaningful. So you have to understand, at that time, there was literally nothing here on the Arugot farm. Yossi and Roni had just paved the road, and there was like a small little structure that had a, it was like a skeleton of a structure with just stone on the outside. And the main retreat center also had just um, a, like two sides of it were also just a skeleton. It looked like an ancient ruin of stones on a mountaintop with no water, no electricity, no trees. And there was just a paved road to the middle of nowhere. So it was just out in nature. And so I'm kind of driving up into the mountains, into this like deep settlement through these caravans onto this mountaintop. And here I am alone in the mountains, kind of walking around. No one's around. No one's it's just me alone in the mountains with a guitar. And in that moment, you know, I felt a little bit crazy. I'm alone in the mountains with a guitar that I don't know how to play, reading words that many of them I don't even understand. And I'm trying to figure out how to connect to God. And as I'm sitting down in these mountains here, it was like, it, it was the, the first day it happened. I had like a moment. It was like, a, it's a moment that sort of, it's captured in time. It's, it's the time almost stops. And you're able to sort of see yourself from the outside looking in. And all of a sudden I had like this moment of like, oh my goodness, if my grandfather's grandfather could see me right now, I am in the mountains of Judea returning from an exile that I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and I am trying to figure out how to reconnect to the God of Israel in these mountains. And I just felt so loved by my ancestors, by Hashem, who allowed me to even have that vision and that feeling 
it was just so because you know you got to be a little bit abraham had to have felt a little bit crazy the prophets had to feel a little bit crazy people that are doing something that's sort of out of the just heard of what everyone else is doing they have to feel a little bit different but in that um differentness is a little bit of a preciousness and i just felt really precious by hashem that here i am trying my hardest to just really pray with all of my heart and and so I wanted to start, so I opened up the prayer book, and here we open it up to Modani, the first verse, the first sentence that a Jew says when he wakes up in the morning. But I didn't know how to play the guitar, and I didn't know what to do. So I knew how to play one guitar from my old days in high school. I only knew how to play one song. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and so my background is a little bit in Southern rock and roll. So thanks to Hootie and the Blowfish, I knew how to play one song. And then this is what happened. <laughs> You know, a friend of mine said, you know, Jeremy Modani, I just love the music video. I love the song. I've been singing it all day. Thank you so much for bringing that song down. And I'm like, bringing it down? I mean, some songs were channeled maybe through me, but that one is really brought down by Hootie and the Blowfish. <laughs> and so, you know, I was coming out here and then eventually like I wanted, I just went through all of the morning prayers and I just trying to read King David's words and trying to like figure out what melodies would fit. And all of a sudden these beautiful melodies came to me. And that's like each part of the prayer is going forward. I'm like developing more and more songs and month after month, I'm just coming out to these mountains. So inspired all alone. Everyone is going to synagogue and I'm alone in the mountains of Judea with my guitar. Best way to start my day ever. You know, for 15 years we were married and I had no clue that you knew how to play the guitar at all. And suddenly you picked up the guitar and started playing the guitar. Okay, that's kind of cool. I love to find out new things about my man that I didn't know before. <laughs> but but then then you're like, oh, no, I don't only know how to play guitar. I'm a I'm a composer. <laughs> and suddenly he's writing songs and playing songs. And I, after a few weeks, I couldn't I couldn't even imagine Jeremy not walking around with a guitar every single place he went. <laughs> and, and and after after about a month of fiddling around the guitar you're like i think i'm gonna put out an album <laughs> it wasn't after a and month. i'm like an album it was seriously it was about after a month and you're and you were like i think one day i'm gonna put out an album i'm like an album i didn't even know you knew how to play guitar and you're like oh no not now i mean in a few months oh in a few months <laughs> yeah it's just whatever you're always months. full of surprises you know months i just kept on coming back to this place and kept on trying to sing to god and then after about six or seven months I'm like wow these melodies are beautiful i have music to psuke does even the world needs to know this and then it took me about three and a half years to finally finish the album but i brought the best musicians in judea to come and uh and now there's music to the prayers it's just beautiful only later did i find out that the arugot farm is positioned exactly in the mountains of zif in the bible in the 23rd chapter of the book of samuel it says that king david fled to the mountains of zif to hide from king saul before he became king saul wanted to kill him he was jealous david had just killed goliath he was gaining more and more popularity saul actually loses it he becomes a little bit insane and hunts david down and david runs to the mountains of the arugot farm the midrash says that most of the book of psalms was written in the mountains of zif before david became king why did david run to the arugot farms when he was hiding from shaul because 15 minutes away is bethlehem now we have a small flock of sheep here on the farm we take the sheep out in the morning and we bring them back in the evening but the Bedouins here in the area, they take their sheep out for seven, eight, nine, ten 10 days at a time. So when David was a boy, 
he used to live very similar to the way the Bedouins live now. Mm. And from Bethlehem, he would come out into these mountains for eight, nine, ten days at a time. He knew how to live in these desert mountains. He knew where the water was. He knew how to find food. He knew the caves. He knew all of these back. Saul had no chance of finding him. This was his backyard. And then only to realize that here I am singing the words of King David in the place where King David wrote those words. It's like my prayer was taken to like a whole other level. Whereas, you know, growing up in Atlanta, the Bible was like fairy tales and legends and stories. But you come to Israel and the Torah and the Tanakh, it's like three dimensional. It's not black letters on white paper. It's in living color and you're inside the story and you're at the same places where it happened. And all of a sudden now I'm able to like add on to King David's words, music. To his words, you know, so, you know, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, I had, uh, you know, I, 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 I was, my parents sent me to a non-Jewish uh, day school for a few years of my life. My parents were programming me to be an international businessman since I was a little kid. They sent me to summer camp where I was learning Russian. They sent me to a day school where I was learning Spanish. And so I had a bunch of friends and a lot of my friends liked rap music and I never really liked rap music. I like rock and roll. And only later of three or four years, like I'm now almost 40. Three years ago, someone told me, do you know what the word rap means? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, do you know what the word rap means, Stila? It's a word. It's a thing. R rhythm and something. Yeah, it's an acronym, rhythm and poetry. Oh. And I never knew that. And I was like, oh, my goodness. King David was the first rapper. He's mm -hmm. the first man in human history to ever put rhythm to poetry. And here I am now putting my own rhythm to his poetry. And I just felt like the moments here, my first connection with these mountains was a connection of just a love affair with this land, uh, just in an attempt to try to connect to the divine. And without us even knowing the heart of the Arugot farm, the buildings that we're building here, the groups that we're bringing here, it's really all centered around prayer. And without us really knowing the fact that this place was destined to be a center of prayer was already encoded into the stones of this mountain millennia ago mm. long before we were born this is what this place was destined to be and just by trying to figure out how to align myself with hashem to try to figure out how to really tune myself into his will and to really pray from my heart i ended up in these mountains it's just marvelous so for me the move out to the farm has also been a really profound journey into the world of tefillah of prayer when, uh, you know, when I used to work in a law firm, I was just, you know, I was always trying to sneak in a little, you know, a little morning prayer on the way. And part of my dream was that one day we're going to come out to the farm and we're just going to simplify our life. And I'm going to have so much time to, to pray. And my prayers are just going to be so beautiful. But then the reality kind of smacked me in the face. We moved here and we were working so hard to unpack our stuff and not lose our kids and try to just make some sort of order out of our life. I remember three days right after we moved here, I suddenly realized I had literally just forgotten to pray for three days. And I felt so bad. I was so embarrassed all of a sudden. You have to understand that we didn't have a bathroom. We didn't have a kitchen. We didn't have bars on our windows. It, our stuff was everywhere. Everything was covered in dust. You have to go a little bit easy on yourself. Yeah. Well, so I, I was at that point, I remember three days in, I said, it's not like just living here on the farm is going to make my life into a work of art and prayer. It's something that I'm going to have to actually really work on. I have to cut out time and make time to focus on prayer. And so, um, you know, as a mom of six kids, that's not that much time in the day. So the time that I chose was I said, I'm just going to get up before the kids get up, get up really early at sunrise. And that's going to be my time to focus on prayer. And the most amazing things started happening. I started going out to that balcony that you were just talking about, Jeremy, the, where, where you can see all of the Arugot, um, you know, the Arugot River and the beautiful views that are here on the farm. And I started going out there in the morning and watching the sunrise. And what I discovered by making this special time to go out to Davin while everyone else was sleeping and to just go out into nature, I, I discovered that early in the morning, there is simply the most amazing cosmic drama going on. You know, the bracha, that you, the blessing that you say right before the Shema is Yotzer Or Uvarech Choshech. Right? You bless Hashem as the one who makes light and creates darkness. And right here on the farm, you can see the sun rising on one side 
over, over the, the mountains of Moab. Over the mountains of Moab and, uh, and shining on the Dead Sea. But on the other side, because there's no streetlights here or any kind of artificial lighting, you can still see the stars in the pitch black sky on the other side and actually watch the light go to battle against the darkness and slowly creep through the darkness and turn it into light. Instead of saying that bracha at nine in the morning where nothing is really happening, I was able to actually start feeling the prayers in the time that you're supposed to say them, the time that they were written in. Well, so look at this. In Psalm 108, it says, Awake, O guitar and harp. It says nevel, but I'm going to say that as guitar because that's how I connected to it. Because it's, <laughs> sort of, it's some sort of string instrument. Awake, O nevel and harp. I shall awaken the dawn. I will thank you among the nations, Hashem. I will sing to you among the peoples. And I thought to myself, that is just amazing that in fact based on that verse in the book of psalms the first codified law in judaism you open up the shulchan aruch it says that a man should wake up before the dawn that he should awaken the dawn so instead of the dawn waking us it's us awakening the dawn, us greeting the dawn instead of the dawn greeting us. Instead of being woken up by the sun, being reactive as your first action in the morning, it's saying, I am taking proactive measures to awaken the dawn. So that, that this experience of, of starting to wake up early and daven outside in nature, it, it solved for me this mystery that's always kind of bothered me in my mind about the oral tradition. You know, the the first codification of all of the Torah Shabal Peh, all of our oral law in Judaism, starts is in the Mishnah, and it starts in the Tractate of Brachot. So I would kind of imagine, I mean, if I was the one writing the Mishnah and writing down all of our oral tradition, I would want to start with, you know, something spiritual, something meaningful, something that touches the heart, you know, what's like the purpose of life, right? The, the mysteries of Judaism. What, is, what does the Mishnah start with? Like the very, when, when, when Rabbi Yehuda Nasi comes and says, this is the oral tradition here. Everyone listen up. What does he start with? What time are we allowed to start saying the Kriyachma? What time do you dive in? What time do you pray? And I've always thought to myself, wow, isn't that a little bit technical? And I mean, we, not, not, not that there's not place for the technical, you know, parameters of prayer and that's okay. But does that really have to be the opening line? Couldn't it start with something that was a little bit more deep into the meaning of prayer? Well, you know, uh, the more I've um, continued to explore prayer and Jewish life in general, it seems as though uh, encoded in the biblical calendar, encoded within time, are moments, energies, opportunities where we can draw close to Hashem. Exactly. And it is the prophetic order. It's like a key given to us. When is the most opportune time to pray in the morning? Let me tell you, it's with the sunrise. There is an energy opportunity at that time that you can't have at any other time of the day. Exactly. That's what I realized, that, that, the, that the rabbis, the sages were giving us not just technical guidelines, but giving us just it, <laughs> the most amazing advice. Yeah, you can daven a little bit later. The Mishnah says you can daven a little bit past the sunrise, but the ideal is to get up really early and there's some sort of energy that's in the world and, and you have to, you can try this and take, or you, know, you don't have to take my word for it. Any, you know, you can try this and feel it. I, I, I've yet to meet someone who doesn't feel it when they do it. There's something about that time and the energy that's around in that exact moment that just lends itself to an amazing morning prayer. So you have to understand my relationship with Tehillah, at least in my mind, and I think in hers, was really based on prayer. You know, we were really young when we got married. She was 19, I was 22, and I felt like the decision was just too much for me to make. And so first I did as I outsourced the decision to my parents. I said, Tehila, here is the phone number of my parents. You can give them a call. You can invite them out to dinner. And if my parents approve, then we can move forward. But I'm not making this decision without my mom and dad. Yeah, that was really cute. Jeremy's like, you know what would be so nice if you went out to dinner with my parents? And I said, oh, I would love to go out to dinner with you and your parents. No. Not with me and my parents, <laughs> just with my parents. Like, you want me to go out with just your parents? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I guess I can do that. Okay, well, anytime they want. Well, you know what would be so cool? If you called them and asked them out for dinner. <laughs> what is this? Are you putting me so through 
some kind of test. <laughs> Clearly, yes. yes. <laughs> but you did very well on the test. I you passed, passed with test, flying luckily. colors. Listen, my parents were marriage therapists for 20 years in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm like, if I, before I get married, I want to make sure that my parents think that she's okay. And they loved you. Anyway, after, you know, we had to make decisions very quickly. And I just felt like uh, ultimately when big decisions come, um, I just leave it up to God. I pray with all of my heart and I just hope for the best. And in fact, you know, King David's son, Solomon, when he became king, he had this um, a dream where Hashem appeared to him. Solomon was also a prophet. And Hashem said to him, I give you one wish, anything you want. You're the new king of Israel. Wish away. It was like the Jewish Aladdin story. I mean, Aladdin was inspired by this biblical story, except he didn't get three wishes. He got one wish. And when you ask people, and I ask people all the time, what did Solomon wish for? Almost everyone says, well, he wished for wisdom. Because over and over again, the Bible refers to Solomon as the wisest of all men. But if you look in the text, he didn't ask for wisdom at all. He asked for a lev shomea, a listening heart. Mm. And that's something totally different. That's not, you know, wisdom is in the intellect, it's in the IQ. But a listening heart is an ability to tune in to an inner intuition that Hashem speaks to you through that in your heart and says, I am the king of Israel. And the truth is everyone is the king of their own home. And we all have to make decisions. Who are we going to marry? What are we going to do? Am I going to go out to war? Am I going to raise taxes? Everyone has to make decisions. How do we make decisions? Solomon said, if I have one wish to make Hashem, I want you to give me a listening heart that when I need to make decisions, I'm able to tune in to know what decision is best to make. And because of that, he became known as the wisest of all men because he had the most amazing decisions because he was tuning in. So at 22, I was doing my very best to tune into the will of God, saying like, I have this girl in front of me. She seems amazing. Is this what I'm supposed to do? And I feel like ever since then, every time we have some type of um, challenge, fights, issues, I feel like it's almost always solved through our joint effort in prayer. But more than prayer in some ways is that why are you laughing because sometimes i get so mad at you that i don't even want to explain to you why i'm mad at you and then i'm just like oh you better pray <laughs> you better pray <laughs> oh, you better pray <laughs> but well, Tila, why are you mad at me you better go pray. <laughs> go pray about it no, so the problem is that i think even um even in some ways more fundamental than the basis of our relationship being in prayer and i feel like i don't even understand how people can be married without that is our mission Tehillah and I were married with a common mission. It was like a covenant to our marriage that first and foremost, we are together with a purpose to grow and to develop. We have a purpose together to draw closer to Hashem, to become the best people that we can be in this lifetime. And the truth is sometimes I'm developmentally challenged. I kind of chuckle to myself when you say, when you say the covenant the covenant that our marriage is based on because Jeremy is such an intense guy. You know, when you invite somebody, a family over for Shabbat lunch, most people, they talk about how was work? What's the weather? How are your kids doing? <laughs> Jeremy's a pretty intense guy. I remember we, we sometimes invite people over. We had over with the, you know, our, our neighbors in Neve Daniel and we sit down with them for the first time and he says, so what's the covenant upon which your marriage is based? <laughs> And people are kind of like, oh, we both like the Grateful Dead. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that, you know, if, you know, some people in the Western world, when they get married, the question is really simple. It's like, you know, what does this person do for me? And what does that person do for me? And that's the question. And eventually, maybe they're not going to do a good enough job, or maybe what you want is going to change. But I feel like in the biblical marriage in a Jewish concept, we are both on shlichut. We are both sent here on a mission and joining together on a mission outside of us is really what brings us together. I had a beautiful doctor friend, a non-Jewish guy from Texas who told me right um, as I was talking, going through marital issues and I'm seeking this, his advice. And he said to me that uh, marriage is like a triangle and you and your wife are on the bottom corners. And at the top of the triangle is really a Kaddish Baruch Hu is Hashem. And the closer you draw to him, the closer you draw to each other. And I feel like if there is a mission outside of us that we are both focused on, trying to achieve that mission, and for us, I think it's to serve Israel, to serve Hashem, then as we continue on that mission, we draw closer to each other. Mm. I think it's all rooted in a deep belief that we can really change ourselves. 
that we can transform our lives, that we can change the way we look, we can change the way we feel, we can change the way we act, we can fix our attributes. If we work on it, if we pray on it, and we're consistent, we can really transform our lives. But then sometimes I look at the fights that you and I have, and I feel like they are the same fights that we had when we were in our early 20s, and I'm almost 40 now. It's because you don't actually listen to me. (laughs) No, I'm listening, but I just, somehow it's just like the same, and the truth, the fights, I hear the fights reverberating throughout the generations of the Jewish people. I feel like you and I have been having the same fights for multiple lifetimes already now. And now that we sort of live a more biblical life on a farm, I can just hear, Jeremy, what are you outside with the chickens for? When the children are away, we have to get them out to school. Like, what do you do? Just the same fights over and over again. So on one end, I really do believe that we can uh, transform ourselves. But on the other hand, I see that no matter how hard I try, I keep on making the same mistakes over and over again. Yeah. Con- consider the possibility that uh, the the reference to past lives might just be an excuse for not listening. It's like, hey, <laughs> baby, you should try to like do what I ask. Oh, yeah. We've been fighting this fight for 500 years. Oh, we've been doing this forever. Oh, you don't even know. It goes back like multiple reincarnations. <laughs> I don't know if that's like a great excuse. It reminds me, I heard this uh, researcher talking on the radio about this uh, document that they discovered from about 500 years ago in one of the, sh- like of a, of a Jew from one of the shtetls. It was either a, a diary or, or a letter that he was writing to his rabbi and he's talking about how miserable his wife makes him. Because <laughs> all she does is yell at me because I, I, I'm always missing the bedpan and she always gets upset that I went to the bathroom at night and I missed the bedpan. And I thought to myself, wow, nothing's really changed. Like women are still getting mad at men for the same exact thing. Now it's just about putting down the toilet seat. <laughs> Nothing has changed. But anyway, I'm not, I'm not quite as optimistic uh, as you about the possibility of having dramatic change. I think you can change within the deck you've been handed. You know what I mean? Like you're, not, you're going to be able to move things a little. Chazal say that if a person can change one attribute, one mida, it's a huge, huge accomplishment. Because it's hard. It's hard to fundamentally change things. Well, I don't know if you can necessarily change an ingrown, innate attribute like a someone i for example suffer from anxiety and from nervousness i'm just a nervous guy but i was able in some ways to overcome all the fears and all of the tensions and all of the anxieties that this move uh, had and there were so many and um so even though you may have a certain tendency towards nervousness maybe you can't fundamentally change the nervousness but you can transform your lives to not let that inhibit Mm. you Mm -hmm. So you can grow in that way. It reminds me of our friend who ate over at our house for Shabbat. And she said, how did you guys get married so young? I mean, there was so much, you know, more time that you might've changed. You know, the brain continues to grow until the age of 25. How do you know that, you know, when you got married, maybe your brain was going to continue growing and you wouldn't have been a good match for one another. And I said, well, you know, I've been with Jeremy since he was 22. And I can tell you with absolute certainty that there was no continued brain growth. (laughs) So rest your heart assured <laughs> that we didn't have any problems in that department. <laughs> well, on the subject of, of changing growth, something that I've really grown in since we moved to the farm was in my relationship with the Jewish prayer book, with the Sidur. The Sidur and I have always had kind of a complicated relationship because it's a lot of liturgy. It's a lot to cover. Like in the morning when you have to cover, there's a lot of pages. There's a lot of ground to cover. So there were two things that happened to me in my relationship with the Sidur. Because, well, part of it is that, you know, all of these these prayers are are written down. And you sometimes say to yourself, am I just supposed to be reading somebody else's words all day long? How do I connect to these words? So two things happened to help me. The first was that I came across Rav Dov Zinger's book. It's called Tikon Tfilati. It, It actually just came out a little while back in English called may our prayers be pleasant and it's um it's an english translation it's if you could believe such a thing it's a cookbook a recipe book for prayer meaning rav dov zinger uh, the rosh yeshiva of uh, makor chaim the makor chaim yeshiva who's a real pioneer in jewish spirituality he said i'm not writing a book of philosophy about prayer telling you what you need to think and what you need to do i'm making a cookbook it's a book of recipes, of, of, of exercises that you can choose from. You don't need to do anything, everything. And he has just a huge amount of exercises there that you can do to enhance your prayers. And one of the things he says is that you don't have to look at the Sidur as 
something that you have to say every single solitary word. He says, when you go to a restaurant, you don't order everything on the menu. You order maybe an appetizer, an entree, a drink. If you're really lucky, you order a dessert. Right? Do you know what I mean, Jerry? Sure. Like well, the truth is, you see, in yeshiva, we're trained that if you come late to davening, well, then there's actually a system. Baruch Shamar, Ashrei, mm -hmm. first hallelujah, last hallelujah, ishtavach. You have to like, and so it becomes a checklist. Oh, I got to say this, got to say this, got to say this, got to say this. And I think Rav Dov's chiddush here, his like insight, his uh, just his guidance is to say that the Sidur is so vast, written over so many centuries, don't look at it as a checklist, look at it as a menu. And say, are you in the mood for some praise? Are you in the mood for thanks? Are you in the mood for yearning and calling out to God at this point? And instead of trying to run through all of the checklists, it's to sort of see where your spirit is guiding you and then find it within the Sidur. Mm. Yeah, so that really, so his book, that, that insight and his book in general really helped me. If, if, you, if you can get your, anybody who can get their hands on that book, it's a real, um, it's a real pearl. It truly helps the, the inner work of prayer. Um, the second thing that happened to me was, was this kind of dream that came to me where I was sort of looking at the Jewish prayer book at the Sidur and suddenly I started to imagine all of the people that wrote those prayers and thinking to myself, because you know, the Jewish prayer book didn't come together all at once. It was a compilation of just a huge amount of totally anonymous people who took time out of a life that was surely filled with many struggles, took time to write down something that came from their hearts. And what came out of their hearts touched other people's hearts enough to the point that it was worth it for them to try to somehow come across a scroll and a quill and ink and pass this along from generation to generation until it was canonized in the Jewish sitter. And they didn't sign their names on it and they didn't give any hint to who they are. Most of them, we don't even know who the authors were. And if we do know, it's just from historic study. It's not because there's any hint to it in the Sidur and the humility that these people had to share their inner, their inner prayers and their inner hearts with us. I, I used to look at the Sidur as like a burden as this liturgy that I'm stuck saying. And now I realize that it's this, uh, that from this dream, I realize it's this gift that all of these, that so many different people had to come together to make and the dedication that the Jewish people had to have over the generations to keep these from, you know, throughout all of our suffering in the, in the exile, to keep these prayers that came out of different people's hearts and compile them together into one book that went from hand to hand and from father to son is such, is such an amazing gift that we get to now be back in Eretz Yisrael and bring their words to life. It's as if we're bringing them back to life. You know, the, the deepest messages that they each had and with such humility left us without even signing their names, we're able to now speak for them. And even though they're gone, we can bring their spirits back to life here in the land. Yeah, you know, Abraham Joshua Heschel says that a journey through the Sidur is really communing with the eternal spirit of Israel. As like the Jewish people have been praying uh, throughout the centuries, the most touching prayers were recorded, saved, and passed down to the next generation. And then more prayers were added. And as you're reading and praying through the book, you're praying through the centuries, communing with all the spirits that have brought us until today. Yeah. And it's, I'll give you an example. Right? You, you made a song. You were just talking about it, about Modani. Right? The first prayer. Modani is the first prayer that every Jew says in the morning. Every small child, it's the first thing they learn when they go to nursery school. Every little, right? Our, our four-year-old child knows how to say Modani. I didn't know who even wrote Modani until you told me. I was going to surprise you and tell you right now, but now I realize that I'm in advanced dimension and I've already forgotten that I've told you. Okay, well, I'll tell everybody else. Okay, well, let's see if you remember. Jeremy, who no, wrote it? No, I was trying to circumvent that question by saying you've already no, told no, no, me. No, no, I was going to oh, come on, dude, you're a rabbi and you wrote a song about Modani. You don't know who wrote Modani? Oh, no, I'm being busted for oh. my ignorance. I've written an entire book on Psuke de Zimra. Okay, Rabbeinu, so would you like me to open your eyes once again? See, that's the, the, the joy of getting to talk with Jeremy all the time is that he just forgets what I say. I get to thrill him time and time again. Gimpels have a problem with names. We're not very good with names. Very good with faces, names, not so much. So no one knows exactly who wrote it, but, phew. well, that's not a few because I'm about to tell you who probably wrote it. We know who probably wrote it. Okay. It seems to have been written by Rabbi Moshe Ibn Yehuda Machir. He was a mystic in Sfat in the 1500s. He died in the year 1610. And how did his prayer come to exist? He actually didn't write any books. He had a little group of people that came together. They called it Haveri Makshivim, friends that are listening. And friend, listening friends, and they came together as a group of mystics 
trying to dedicate their lives to the service of Hashem. And they would meet and just try to discuss what they were struggling with and develop their, develop their worship. And so this rabbi, he wrote this journal called Seder Yom. And it was about him trying to make his days a beautiful service of God. And he wrote down his schedule. Like, I get up in the morning and I do this. And in the afternoon, I do this. And in the evening, I do this. And he's writing everything he does. And he wrote in this diary of his. And the first thing I say when I wake up in the morning is, Modani. And he writes this prayer that he made of Modani. And somehow when his son went to Europe, and somehow this journal went from hand to hand, from person to person, and someone read this prayer and thought that it was so touching that he wrote it down for himself. And somehow that got passed from person to person until it was integrated to be one of the most fundamental Jewish prayers. You can imagine it's actually really recent. You're talking about the 17th century. This is not a very, very old prayer. But somehow it just touched people in a really profound way. Just the, the idea of waking up in the morning and saying thank you to Hashem as the first state of mind that you go into in the morning. And, and to think, you know, he was so, he was so humble and he, he also was so poor. You know, he wrote in his, in his journal about how much he longed to just one day have a beautiful menorah for Hanukkah and his whole life. He never actually, he said that the greatest sorrow in his life was that he was never able to light Hanukkah candles in a beautiful way because he couldn't even afford to buy respectable candles. And that a person like that took time out of his life where he could be working or making money or trying to increase his material possessions, took his time to write down how he's making an effort to sanctify every moment of every day so that people could look back and just, you know, glean little pieces of inspiration. It's such a gift. And now his prayer is the prayer of all Jewish people in the world. It's amazing. Hmm. You know, I just, I feel like in my life, I just want to grow closer to Hashem. But I don't really know what that means. That's also, for me, why I think the best option is to try to live a guided life because I don't know what else to do other than that. I know that there is some sort of a higher intelligence. I mean, God, I don't know what that word means anymore. Like, it's just, clearly there's a system here. There's an intelligence here. There is something that's going on, but it's like there was something before light, before time, before space. It's just beyond. His ways are not our ways. And it's like, I don't even know where to begin starting. But I was taught once again by Abraham Joshua Heschel that you can find Hashem in deeds. You can find him in deeds if you actually wholeheartedly do an act of chesed, wholeheartedly do an act of kindness for someone else. You really give them charity with a whole heart that they feel the love and you feel the love coming back. In that moment, you can experience the divine. Now, we can't understand God, but we can sort of intuit his ways and we can encounter him in deeds and we can encounter him in prayers. And I feel like our life here on the farm, what I wanted it to be, was that somehow our life is a prayer. That everyone that we bring into this place, the messages that we broadcast out from this place, is in some ways just a full embodiment of prayer. Amen. I think there are just so many opportunities to see Hashem's presence in our lives. It's like sometimes there are these things that they seem small, but at the moment that they happen, they feel like Hashem kind of just peeking out and waving at you. I think we called them a spice cart last time. Yeah, spice cart. So I think it's important to, to I find it really helpful to just write them down and remember them because in, in moments of doubt, you can look back at them and draw strength. Like the story that happened to us a few weeks ago, we were at the beach and it was on Shabbat and uh, we, were, we were in Ashkelon for Shabbat and Jeremy's uh, um, brother's family was there as well. And we went down to the park and the park was magnificent. It was packed with just hundreds of people having fun on Shabbat. It felt... It felt so like, like redemption times, right? Everyone's just happy and together and beautiful families. And suddenly my sister-in-law, Vigal, realizes that they've lost the key to their apartment. Now we're on the beach, right? Imagine we're on the beach and there's hundreds of people there in this park that's right next to the beach and, and just like sand and grass and stuff. And it's just finding a key on a beach is literally like finding a needle in a haystack. And so everyone is frantically running, 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 running. I'm like, there is no chance of finding this on our own. Our strength will not allow us to find a key on a beach. It's just not going to happen. So I took, I, I took out my Psalms and I just started davening. I said, Hashem, please help us. They only have one key. They're here with six kids for Shabbat. You know, it's, if they can't get into their apartment, it's going to be a real problem. And I'm just davening and praying. And in the middle of my prayer, this guy comes up to me, kind of interrupts me. Now you have to understand there's hundreds of people on the beach. He picks me out of all of the people, totally randomly, a guy I've never seen in my life. He says, 
Hi, uh, sorry to bother you. My daughter lost her doll. Have you maybe seen her doll? I said, buddy, you think you got problems? We've lost the key to our apartment. We've lost the key to our apartment. I said, when you, when you find our key, I'll start worrying about your doll. He says, was it a red key? I said, yeah, it was a red key. He goes, oh, well, that's so funny. He says, yeah, I just noticed this red key in the weirdest spot in the middle of the beach. And I thought to myself, that's odd. So he led us to the key. And then ironically enough, my little niece had just seen a doll and was able to show the guy his doll. And what were the odds that this guy was going to pick me out of the crowd to ask me where his kid's doll was? There was absolutely no reason. We hadn't had any kind of interaction before. And it was like Hashem had planned the entire had orchestrated this entire thing. And it's just a, like a small, it's like one of those small miracles, but they make you, you know, you walk away from it with just this feeling like, oh, Hashem is looking out for us. But it's sometimes like, you know, when you really are able to tap into a sincere prayer, it is a antenna or a magnet for pulling in providence. Mm. And, you know, probably one of the deepest prayers is for us to make our will his will. I feel like that's what I wanted this farm to really be. I feel like this is what he wanted. How do I make my will his will? And then his will will become my will. If we just are in tune and in line with what he wants in the world, then our will will be his will. I mean, there's clearly a will in this universe, a will to survive, a will to life. There's life all around us. Everyone is willing. Everyone's working. Everyone's doing this. The will of all wills, the, the one that is giving this desire into the world, and all the world is working so harmoniously together. You look at the, all the world of nature. I mean, people are so inspired by it. They have like the Lion King theme song, the circle of life. Everything is so harmonious and a perfect ecosystem of an exact balance. The will is working so perfectly and in harmony, except in human life. All of a sudden in human life, people feel separate, d disillusioned, miserable, d murder, d chaos, pollution. It's like all of the, un the universe is in perfect harmony. And then there is little old man that is just bumbling around on antidepressants, totally confused and disoriented. What's going on? And I think that prayer is really the only answer to realign us with the will of all wills and to hopefully align our will with his will. And I think that is the core of really the tshuva movement. It is just aligning ourselves with Hashem's will. How do we do that? And I think the answer is prayer. So, you know, this has been almost a four-year journey since I first stepped out into these mountaintops. And it started in prayer, and it, the, the middle it's prayer, and the end is prayer. And, uh, you know, Baruch Hashem, you know, after so many years now, we've put out a, a music album of prayer with a book about prayer. And I feel like this is just the introduction of another book that eventually will be written when we're 70. But I felt like there were so many Pace insights. yourself, baby. Pace yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and so, if any of you are interested, you go to YouTube right now. Just type in Jeremy Gimpel Music. Five music videos are out there. And it's like broadcasting the Psalms of King David to the world from the place that they were written. And so hopefully this will be a Beit Tefillah, a house of prayer for all nations. We're one step closer. Amen, amen. I pray that we continue to grow in our Tefillah and Avodat Hashem, all of our listeners. One who doesn't respect and value his past is not worth the honor of the present and has no right to a future. Well, I promise you that I respect and value the past and I please God would love to see honor in the present. And I know that all of us have a right to the future. I'm Rav Mike Foyer, and this is The Jewish Story. Join Rav Mike Foyer for the best Jewish history podcast, The Jewish Story, on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com.